Number 1. Monday, June 5, 1972 is a date that would send chills down the spine of Penrith locals, especially the friends and family of Lynette Ann Melbourne. Fifteen-year-old Lynette wasn't a big girl, just 155 centimeters tall with fair hair and hazel eyes, and was living locally with her family and twin sister, who she was very close with. Lynette was last seen hanging out with three of her friends at Penrith Plaza, where she went and told her mother at work that she was going home to get changed before heading to her boyfriend's house. Lynette was never seen again. And so started one of Penrith's biggest ever mysteries that remains unsolved almost 50 years later. There has been no trace of Lynette since that day in 1972. Six years after her disappearance, in September 1978, the Sun-Herald readdressed her missing persons case. The report said that Lynette's grieving father would search the streets of Sydney late at night in the hope he might come across some sort of a clue in his daughter's disappearance. As a parent, sibling, cousin, or friend could only imagine, never knowing where Lynette disappeared to that night, has taken a toll on her family. Speaking with television show Missing Persons Unit in 2006, Lynette's mother, Pamela Melbourne, retold the tragic story of the day her daughter went missing. On the Sunday night she went to babysit her friend's children in Mount Druid, she said. I worked at Woolworths at the time, and she'd come in there on Monday, and asked could she go to her boyfriend's place. Mrs. Melbourne finished work at 5.30 p.m., and said that both she and Lynette agreed that's when she would be picked up. When I went to pick her up she wasn't there, she said. Lynette has made no contact with family or friends since that date, and Mrs. Melbourne suggested the disappearance of her daughter was out of character. She wouldn't even go in the dark to put a bin out, let alone just disappear, she said to missing persons unit detectives. On the program, Lynette's father, Terry Melbourne, said when they first reported Lynette was missing, it was hard to convince police she hadn't just run away. Their first reaction was that she had run away, and you couldn't convince them that she hadn't run away, because she's very close to her twin sister, he said. Mr. Melman spoke of his heartbreak at losing his daughter, and said as the years go on, it had gotten harder and harder to believe that Lynette would be found. You go to the coroner's court and you hear them say that somewhere around June 5, 1972, that our daughter met her death. That's hard to take, he said. We have this horrible feeling that we could go to our graves not ever knowing what happened to Lynette. We had four children, we still got four children, but one of them, we don't know where she is, and we'd love to find that out. In 2006, 34 years after her initial disappearance, Lynette's case was reopened when a witness came forward and identified a man seen with Lynette in the weeks before she vanished. The witness was a former member of the Penrith community, who said they had seen a person with Lynette that was much older than her, and that it was out of character for her to be with him. The witness, who was very young at the time of Lynette's disappearance, withheld the information under the impression that police had the investigation covered. Detectives on the case said police would have spoken to this person of interest, but at the time, everyone who knew Lynette didn't know she had any association with this person. The missing persons unit said Mr. Melbourne recognized the face of the man seen with Lynette after being presented a photo of them together. Since then, the case has been suspended, with very few fresh leads. While it is highly likely that Lynette Melbourne passed away long ago, her remains have never been found. If she were alive today, Lynette Melbourne would be 64 years old. Pamela Melbourne passed away last year. Number 2. Nancy lived with her boyfriend, Jeff Jeffries, and her two young children, Omar Penner and Yana Jeffries, in the 2000 block of Dean Road in Paradise, California at the time of her disappearance. Yana was Jeff's child and Omar was from another relationship. Nancy's friend invited her over to celebrate Halloween on October 31, 1983. This is the last day Nancy had contact with anyone. 
She never arrived at her friend's home. A few weeks later, her brother tried to contact her to invite her over for the Thanksgiving Day dinner, but he wasn't able to reach her. Her brother reported her missing on December 19th. Jeff stated he had come home one day and discovered blood in the house and Nancy gone. On December 22nd, which was Nancy's birthday, Jeff took her two children and left California, flying to Hawaii. He later returned with them. He left Omar with relatives in California and left Yana with his stepsister in Iowa. Omar was adopted and changed his name to Daniel, though as an adult he resumed using his birth name. Jeff died by suicide in Missouri in 1986. He left a note citing a breakup with a woman. As an adult, the last memory Omar had of his mother was seeing Jeff shoot Nancy in the family's bathroom. She ran out of the house holding her arm, and Omar never saw her again. Police did find a bullet lodged in the bathroom cabinet at Jeff and Nancy's house, which supports Omar's memory. Very little evidence is available, as to Nancy's fate, the investigation stalled after Jeff's death. Omar believes her body may be buried in a remote area of Butte County, California, or possibly thrown down one of the region's many mine shafts. Nancy's case remains unsolved. Number 3. Luis Sierra, the New York man accused in the grisly 1976 murder and dismemberment of 15-year-old Evelyn Colin, whose body and that of her near full-term fetus were found along the Lehigh River 44 years ago, waived extradition Tuesday, and is in the Carbon County Jail. Investigators describe the 63-year-old Ozone Park bus driver as very cooperative, but release few new details during a media briefing Wednesday in Lehighton, saying they did not want to jeopardize the ongoing investigation. Sierra is charged with one count of homicide in the killing of Colin, who was known only as Beth Doe before last week. The teen was strangled and shot in the neck. Carbon County District Attorney Michael Greek said 1976 law did not allow for homicide charges when the victim was an unborn child, but prosecutors are still researching to determine if other crimes might apply. State troopers on Wednesday would not discuss whether they believe Colin was killed elsewhere and dumped in Carbon County or whether the crime occurred in Pennsylvania. Colin was arraigned late Tuesday. No lawyer was listed on court records Wednesday. Greek praised the more than 100 police officers who have worked on the investigation since 1976. Their perseverance may bring at least some level of closure to her family, to what was a tragic and long-standing mystery, he said. Sierra's arrest begins the final chapter in one of Pennsylvania's most vexing unsolved homicides. Flanked by current and retired investigators in the case, Trooper Anthony Petrosky spoke Wednesday about the efforts made to identify Colin and her baby over the years, including exhuming her body to extract DNA as forensic science advanced, to entering her information in numerous missing persons databases, hoping for a match. Shortly after the exhumation in 2007, state police held a graveside service for Colin and her child, with troopers acting as pallbearers. State Police Lt. Evan M. Brudeski on Wednesday said Colin's family is still processing the news that she's been identified after 44 years. They were elated, however the grisly details were upsetting to them, Brudeski said. The remains of Colin and a near full-term fetus were found December 20, 1976, on the Lehigh River Bank in East Side, Carbon County, about 50 miles north of Allentown. A 14-year-old boy playing near the river found Colin's head and the fetus 10 feet away in grass and weeds below the Interstate 80 overpass. Police found the rest of Colin's remains in suitcases lined with a New York newspaper and believe they were thrown from the overpass. An autopsy showed that the woman's limbs were removed after her death. Her head was also severed, with her ears and nose cut off. Police believe the killing occurred about 24 hours before the remains were discovered. It was ruled a homicide. It was another scientific breakthrough that finally led to Colin's identification. 
Forensic genealogy, the investigative practice of entering crime scene DNA into public databases of genetic information, led police to Colin's cousin in 2020. He put them in touch with her father, in Stroudsburg, who confirmed that Colin fit the unidentified victim's description, and that she went missing in 1976, when she was eight or nine months pregnant. Colin's family provided detectives with Sierra's name, and on March 31st they tracked him down at his home, court records say. Although Sierra, who was 19 in 1976, initially denied knowing Colin, court records say, he eventually admitted that they dated, and she was about to have his child. He told police that Colin threatened to leave him, so when he did not find her home one day he assumed she had gone to live with her mother. He could not provide an explanation as to why he made little to no effort to get in contact with Evelyn or their child, detectives wrote on arrest papers. Though describing him as very cooperative Wednesday, troopers declined to elaborate on their subsequent discussions with Sierra. Though there has been speculation over the years that Colin was the victim of a serial killer, investigators believe her killing was the result of a more common cause of women's death, domestic violence. Court records say Colin warned her family that Sierra was abusive and jealous, and that he would often keep her locked in their Jersey City, New Jersey apartment. Evelyn had told their mother that she feared Sierra and that, if anything happened to her, he was likely involved. Court records say Colin and Sierra, who went by the name Gisso, had recently moved into an apartment together when she vanished. Family members described visiting the apartment one day in mid-December 1976 to bring the pregnant teen soup, but found it emptied. Court records say Colin was never seen again, though her family recalled getting a letter in January 1977 stating the couple had moved to Connecticut and had named their baby Luis. Based on Colin's lack of capability as a writer, they did not believe she sent the letter, court records say. Colin's family did not report her missing. Petrovsky declined to discuss that part of the case, but said he had no doubt Colin would have been identified more quickly had she gone missing today, due to advances in DNA technology. Colin and her unborn child are buried in Lorrytown Road Cemetery near Weatherly, where Carbon County officials place unclaimed bodies. After she was named last week, the sign on her gravesite was changed from Beth Doe to Evelyn Colin. Colin's family started a Gotham to raise money for a memorial service. The online fundraiser states that her baby was a girl, and the family named her Emily Grace Colin. Sierra is being held without bail. State police have established a tip line for the case, asking anyone with information to call 800-472-8477, 804-PA tips and mention reference number 1956. Number 4. On December 18, 1996 a groundskeeper for Pleasant Valley Memorial Park Cemetery stumbled upon the body of a woman who was lying near the section where infants were buried. Unfortunately she had taken a mixture of alcohol and Valium, and then placed a plastic bag over her head, and taped the bottom of it. She was also wearing headphones and listening to Mel Brooks and Carl Reiner doing the 2,000-year-old man. This was how she died. She left two notes at the scene, one for the coroner and one for the cemetery, both with the same type note, deceased by own hand, prefer no autopsy. Please order cremation with funds provided. Thank you, Jane Doe. She also brought with herself to the scene a small Christmas tree adorned with red ribbons and gold balls. A green knapsack that held Jeff Foxworthy's You Might Be a Redneck cassette, a tape of Monty Python and the Holy Grail, two empty juice bottles, and a new roll of masking. She was a 50 to 70 year old woman around 5'0 and 157 pounds. She had curly red, or auburn hair that was mostly a cooper color. She had an 8-inch scar on her abdomen most likely due to a C-section. Her fingernails were painted red. 
She was wearing a medium teal all-weather Eddie Bore hooded jacket a large navy blue classiques and your sweater a XL red classiques and your sweater, a petite large red classiques and your sleeveless silk shirt, a large navy blue classiques and your knit wool pants knee-high stockings, white support bra, white fruit of the loom underpants, and size 7 black loafers daughter clothes may have come from an upscale store such as Saks Fifth Avenue. Her jewelry includes a pair of bifocals, two clip-on earrings, a small gold women's guess watch with a mesh band, a 14-karat gold ring with four jade stones, and a metal bead chain with a medical alert no code, DNR, no penicillin. The area she was found in would be difficult to find, and probably may not be known to a drifter. This does not mean she did not happen upon the area. All the infant graves she was found lying near were more recent. Number 5. Jennifer Pandos was extremely upset on February 9, 1987. The 15-year-old told some of her friends that she and her boyfriend had been fighting, and she was very distraught about it. She spent the evening at her home in Williamsburg, Virginia, where she lived with her mother and father. They didn't notice anything unusual about her behavior and she didn't mention anything about having problems with her boyfriend. Jenny was a sophomore at Lafayette High School in James City County, Virginia, just outside her hometown of Williamsburg. She was a friendly and popular student who enjoyed the social aspects of high school, and she rarely missed class. On the morning of February 10th, Margie Pandos was surprised when 6 a.m. came and went and she didn't hear the sounds of her daughter getting into the shower. Jenny was extremely predictable in the morning, and was always in the shower by 6 a.m., so she would have enough time to get dressed, and do her hair, before leaving for school. Assuming that Jenny had overslept, Margie knocked on her bedroom door. When she didn't get a reply, she tried to enter Jenny's bedroom, but found the door locked. This was also surprising, Jenny always slept with her door unlocked. Margie woke up her husband, Ron, and the two of them were able to force their way into Jenny's bedroom. They weren't sure what they would find when they opened the door, but they were met with only silence. Jenny wasn't in her room. The first thing they noticed was that one of the window blinds had been bent down, as if Jenny had been trying to look out the window from between the blinds. As Margie and Ron scanned around the room, trying desperately to determine what was going on, they saw that Jenny had left a note on her pillow. It didn't appear to be written in Jenny's handwriting, and it started out with your daughters with me. She's fine. She's having some problems and needs some time away. The second paragraph of the note was written in the same handwriting as the first, but sounded as if it had been written by Jenny. I'm fine. I just need time to think. The note then instructed Margie and Ron to go to work as usual if they wanted to hear from Jenny. Both of you please go to work tomorrow cause I will try to call you. I won't call you at home, only at one of y'all's work. As if anticipating their next move, the note then instructed Jenny's parents to leave the police out of it. Do not call the police. I can easily find out if you do. I may never come back home. Don't tell my friends about this. Just tell them that I am sick. Margie and Ron weren't sure what to do. They wanted to call the police, but they were afraid that doing so might mean they would never see their daughter again. As they looked around Jenny's room, they realized that the only thing the teenager had taken with her had been her purse. She hadn't even taken a coat with her, despite the freezing February temperatures. All of Jenny's clothing, shoes, makeup, and other belongings were still in her room. They took this as a hopeful sign that she would indeed be back soon. They couldn't imagine that Jenny would go anywhere for an extended period of time without being able to change her clothes and do her makeup. Reluctantly, they decided to go to work as usual and hope that Jenny called one of them to let them know exactly what was going on with her. The day passed without any contact from Jenny. Margie had spent most of her time at work staring at the phone, willing it to ring. 
She wasn't sure what to think when Jenny didn't call. She wanted to call the police, but she and Ron decided to wait for a couple of days. Perhaps Jenny would call one of them the following day. After three days without any contact from the teenager, Margie called the Williamsburg Police Department and reported Jenny missing. She showed detectives the note that Jenny had left and told them that even though it didn't look like Jenny's handwriting, the wording did sound like her daughter, and she thought it was possible that she had indeed written it. Some of the investigators who examined the note speculated that Jenny, who was left-handed, had written the note with her right hand in order to disguise her handwriting. Detectives were extremely interested in speaking with Jenny's boyfriend, Tony Topler, and they brought him in for questioning. He admitted that the couple had been having some problems, and their relationship had always been an on and off one. He was adamant that he had nothing to do with Jenny's disappearance, like all of her friends, he was surprised to learn that she was missing in the first place. Everyone had assumed that she had not been in school because she was sick. After interviewing him several times, detectives eventually determined that Tony was telling the truth and was not involved in Jenny's disappearance. At this point, they weren't even sure that a crime had occurred. The teen had left a note saying that she was leaving because she needed time to think about some things. It was apparent that she had run away voluntarily. There was little police would do in this case. The James City County Police Department was assigned Jenny's case, and about a month after she went missing, they made a public plea for help in determining her location. They also announced that they were offering a $500 reward for any information that led to her whereabouts. They received few calls, and though they did follow up on all tips that came in, none of them led to the missing teenager. Although Jenny was initially considered to be a runaway, as months went by without any contact from her, and no reported sightings of her investigators began to fear that she might have run into foul play. Even if she had left her parents' home willingly, the streets were no place for a 15-year-old girl, and it was very possible that something had happened to her after she left the safety of her home. Detectives were unable to come up with any reason why Jenny would have wanted to run away from home in the first place. She had no problems with her mother or father, she was doing well in school, and she didn't use alcohol or drugs. She hadn't been fighting with any of her friends, and except for her on-again off-again relationship with Tony, she seemed to have no reason to leave her comfortable life behind. The note that she left was also somewhat questionable. Although everyone involved believed that Jenny had written the note, why had she felt the need to disguise her handwriting? It's possible that she was trying, indirectly, to let someone know that she was being forced to write the note by some unknown person. Although investigators spoke with Jenny's family, boyfriend, friends, and classmates, none of them were able to offer any insight into where Jenny might have gone. Many of them felt that Jenny wouldn't have run off without saying something to at least one of her friends, but none of them ever heard from her. Despite the monetary reward that was offered for information about Jenny's whereabouts, the case quickly stalled and went cold. It remains that way today. Detectives still aren't sure if Jenny is alive or dead, though after more than 30 years with no contact, they assume the worst. They have conducted several searches of the Williamsburg area using cadaver dogs, but they have never found any evidence related to Jenny's case. Jennifer Lynn Pandos was 15 years old when she went missing in 1987. She has hazel eyes and brown hair, and at the time of her disappearance, she was 5 feet 2 inches tall and weighed 100 pounds. She was last seen wearing blue jeans, a nightshirt with a picture of a panda on the front, a pink sweater, a pink nylon waist-length jacket, and white high-top sneakers. She is left-handed and has a small mole on her left shoulder. If you have any information about Jenny, please contact the James City County Police Department at 757 253 1800. Number 6. Suzanne Sales was a sweet and soft-spoken young woman who was born and raised in Austin, Minnesota. 
She attended junior college there, and shortly after graduating in 1974 she moved to Minneapolis. She got a job as a secretary at the Minnesota Dental School, she worked in the endodontics department, and quickly endeared herself to all her colleagues. While Suzanne was working at the dental school, she started dating one of the dental students. After he graduated in 1978, he moved to Fargo, North Dakota, and began practicing dentistry there. The two continued to maintain a long-distance relationship, and had recently decided to get married. Suzanne was making plans to move to North Dakota after the wedding, and was very excited about it. Tuesday, May 22, 1979 had been a routine day for Suzanne. She worked her normal shift at the dental school, then returned to her apartment. Suzanne lived alone, and rarely had visitors in her apartment. She was extremely security conscious, always meticulously locking her front or behind her whenever she returned home. Suzanne spoke with her mother on the phone around 8 p.m. that evening. Despite the 100-mile distance that separated Suzanne from her parents, she was extremely close with both of them, and called them often. Although it had been five years since Suzanne moved to Minneapolis, her parents left her childhood bedroom exactly the way it was when Suzanne lived there. She always had a place to stay, whenever she wanted to go home for a visit. After getting off the phone with her mother, Suzanne changed into her pajamas. She was known for being extremely modest, even when home alone, and always wore a housecoat over her pajamas. She was planning to watch the Helen Reddy special at 9 p.m., so she turned the television on and settled into her couch. The following morning, Suzanne didn't show up for work. At first, her co-workers weren't too concerned. They knew that Suzanne's grandfather had been ill, and thought something might have happened to him overnight. As the hours went by without a phone call from Suzanne, however, they started to worry. Suzanne had always been an extremely reliable and dependable employee, and it was unheard of for her to miss an entire day of work without contacting someone in the office. Repeated phone calls to Suzanne's apartment went unanswered, and by the end of the business day her co-workers were growing extremely worried. They reached out to her best friend, Chell, hoping that she had heard from Suzanne, but she was as worried as everyone else. Finally, Chell and one of Suzanne's co-workers decided to go to Suzanne's apartment and check in on her. The two women arrived at the apartment building and made their way to Suzanne's front door. They knocked first, but got no response and heard no movement inside. Cautiously, Chell tried the door and was disturbed to discover that it was unlocked. She knew how security conscious her best friend was and instantly knew that something was terribly wrong. She pushed the door open and stepped inside. She walked into a nightmare. It took Chell less than a second to process what she was seeing, and she immediately backed out of the apartment, screaming and crying. It was clear that Suzanne was dead, and her killer had propped her body up against the couch, ensuring that the first thing anyone who entered would see was Suzanne's lifeless stare directed at the door. Chell and Suzanne's co-worker ran to call the Minneapolis Police Department. Officers arrived at the scene within minutes and taped off apartment 305 as a crime scene. Suzanne's apartment was small but it was obvious that she had kept it neat and tidy. Except for a single dresser drawer that looked as if it had been rummaged through, everything in the apartment appeared to be in its proper place. It was clear that robbery hadn't been the motive in this crime, as an expensive wristwatch, three rings, and several pairs of earrings were sitting out in plain sight. It was apparent to detectives that Suzanne had been dead for more than a few hours. This would later be confirmed by the medical examiner, who estimated that she had been dead for about 20 hours by the time her body was found. She was likely killed within an hour of getting off the phone with her mother the night before. Suzanne was mostly clothed when she was found, but her underwear had been removed, and she had been sexually assaulted. 
The killer had strangled her to death with one of her own bras. He likely obtained this from the dresser drawer that had been pulled out. Detectives believe that his only motive had been sexual. They were certain they were dealing with a lust killer. Detectives speculated that Suzanne must have known her assailant. Everyone they spoke to confirmed the fact that Suzanne was extremely conscious of security at all times. She lived in a building that had a security door and a buzzer system, but there had still been times when she refused to open her door to someone she knew because it was too late at night. Several friends told investigators that there had also been times in the past when Suzanne had thought she heard a noise at night and had called them so they could remain on the line with her until she felt that she was safe. She never would have opened her door to him and she didn't know at 9 p.m., especially not once she had already changed into her pajamas. Detectives went door to door in the apartment building, speaking with each resident to determine if they had seen or heard anything that might be helpful to their investigation. Except for one woman who recalled hearing a door slam somewhere between 9 p.m. and 10 p.m., no one was able to provide investigators with any information. As the crime scene was processed, detectives found a pair of Suzanne's underwear that had blood on them. When they were submitted for analysis, it was determined that the blood had not come from Suzanne. Finally, they had something they could use to link a potential suspect to the murder, but they had to find a suspect first. When detectives arrived at the crime scene, Suzanne's television had still been on, tuned to the channel that the Helen Reddy special had been shown on the previous night. They theorized that the killer had come to Suzanne's door around 9 p.m., right as she was getting ready to watch the television program. Once she opened the door, he likely put his hand over Suzanne's mouth, so she couldn't scream and pushed her inside, allowing the door to slam behind him. Suzanne likely tried to fight back, but was so tiny that she was easily overpowered. Detectives believe that she did bite her assailant's hand as it was over her mouth, and she bit hard enough that she drew blood. This would account for why the killer's blood was found on her underwear, the blood transfer likely occurred when he was pulling them off of Suzanne. Investigators spent days processing the crime scene, and they took a total of 110 items into evidence. They were hopeful that one of them might prove to be the key to solving the case, but there was nothing that pointed to who the culprit might be. They had found several fingerprints, but all of them were too smudged to be of any use. During the investigation, a few of Suzanne's friends told police that she had received some disturbing phone calls in the past, and that was one of the reasons why she was so obsessive about security. They didn't believe she had received any calls lately, she changed her listing in the phone book to SL Sales, instead of using her first name, and that appeared to help. Investigators were unable to determine if these past calls had anything to do with the murder. Detectives interviewed everyone who had known Suzanne, and administered lie detector tests to a few potential suspects, all who were tested past. They combed through every sex crime that had taken place in the area over the past year, but were unable to find anything that might link Suzanne's crime to any other. By the end of the year, detectives had exhausted all leads in the case and turned to the FBI for assistance, asking if they could help them understand what kind of person might commit this kind of crime. The FBI obliged, and Suzanne's case was one of the first in the country to have a psychological profile of the killer completed. According to the profile, the murderer was most likely white and younger than 35 years old at the time of the crime. He likely kept a diary or logbook about the crime and may hold on to newspaper clippings about the case. He had felt some kind of kinship or attachment to his victim and might attempt to visit her grave or place some kind of memorial in the newspaper. The profiler believed that, once the killer was caught, he was very likely to confess to what he had done. Although the profile produced by the FBI would be useful once police had a suspect in mind, it was essentially useless without one. Despite their dedication to the case, detectives were forced to admit that they had hit a dead end. 
The case stalled and went cold. It would remain that way for decades. In 2008, the Minneapolis Police Department decided to take another look at the case. They were hopeful that advances in technology might assist them in finding the killer, and they sent the blood samples recovered from Suzanne's underwear for further analysis. Once they had a DNA profile of the killer, they sent DNA samples from six potential suspects to be compared with that of the murderer. All of the samples they sent came from men who had known Suzanne at the time of the murder, and all of them voluntarily gave their DNA for analysis. None of them were a match. The killer remained unknown. The case has been frustrating for detectives because they have the killer's DNA, but have never been able to identify him. His DNA has been compared to all criminal databases, but he has never been entered into any of them. Nor does it match any DNA obtained in any unsolved cases throughout the United States. The killer either never committed another violent crime, or he is already dead. Investigators believe that Suzanne's death might have been an accident, a sexual assault, that went too far, and this scared the killer straight. Whichever the reason, Suzanne deserves justice. Detectives have not yet given up on solving this case, and believe that someone out there has knowledge about the case that could help them identify the killer. If you have any information about Suzanne's murder, please contact the Minneapolis Police Department at 612-673-2941.